Hello everyone, this is Professor Radigari, and in this um, brief recording I want to talk about chapter one. Uh, this is the chapter that should be read in the very first week of the course, and it provides a good, solid foundation for the rest of the uh, semester. So let me just get right into it. Hopefully you've already read the chapter, uh, again chapter one. If you haven't, it might be a good idea to go back, uh, pause this, go read the chapter, and then come back to it. So. What is marketing? Marketing really is just meeting needs through exchange. So you've got buyers, you've got sellers, you've got uh, senders of information, you've got receivers of information, and uh, what marketing is is just meeting needs through the exchange. So anything that facilitates exchange is considered marketing. So the first thing that comes to mind is salespeople. Salespeople facilitate the exchange of information from the firm to the potential customer and they create this, provide this kind of bridge between the two. So they're creating some sort of exchange. Advertising, same thing, there's a, this exchange of information between the seller and the buyer. Um, so that's really what it's all about is facilitating exchange. Uh, another example is distribution. You put uh, goods on a shelf in a supermarket by physically placing those goods in a place where consumers uh, might see that and you know quite possibly purchase the product you're facilitating the exchange between the buyer and the seller. Marketing is an art and it's also a science. Uh, we know a lot about uh, marketing science. We know what works, we know what doesn't work. Uh, problem is it's a little bit fuzzy. There's a lot of gray areas in marketing so Sometimes things work, sometimes other things work. So there's a, a bit of an art involved in it as well. So it's both an art and a science. Marketing is used to create value. And when I say value is we provide through marketing something that is um, appealing or useful to the potential customer, okay? So um, we think back to when automobiles were first created. Let me just say right here that I, I love cars, and I talk about cars a lot in this class because I feel they're very relevant. So you'll get used to me talking about cars as, as my examples in a lot of a lot of these lectures. So, anyways, think about when the automobile first came out. What value did the automobile provide? Well, quite simply, it, it provided the ability to go from place to place, a means of transportation that was quicker than walking and more efficient than using livestock or horses. So. It creates some sort of value. Marketing is used to create value. If we can't create value for products, services, whatever it might be, then we're not going to be in business very long. We have to create value and communicate this value to our potential market. And if we do that successfully, we create demand. And demand is just um, the conversion of value into willingness to purchase and people will actually come and they'll buy your products, buy your services, whatever it might be and that's the end goal. Finally marketing is very long term. Uh, this is something that, that takes place over years and years. Uh, you, um, uh, it's almost impossible to start a marketing program and see results immediately. Um, it takes time and there's a kind of a building up process but over time it does snowball. So. Uh, CEOs get frustrated with this because they want they want turnaround on their money right now immediately and so sometimes it's hard for them to get their uh, minds around long term but um, those that get it get it and it works quite well for them so what is marketed all these things can be marketed goods and services obviously events like a, a Patriots game for example uh, experiences persons we're uh, if you consider the fact that uh, every year or every couple of years there is some sort of election, be it presidential, be it senatorial, be it local county elections, uh, people market themselves and organizations market, market people as well. So persons can be marketed and just we can go on down the list there. I'm not going to go through each one, but just know that pretty much anything uh, can be marketed. So the marketing process involves five kind of overarching, broad, somewhat generic steps. And the first one is we analyze opportunities. We, we understand where their wants 
and needs that are not being met. And uh, where those aren't being met is an opportunity. Okay, so if it's an opportunity out there, we say, okay, well, let's, let's try to create something of value to capitalize upon that opportunity. Then we select targets. Who is most likely to uh, uh, want our product or, or who most likely needs this particular want or need to be satisfied? So you don't want to try to target everybody unless you're selling, I don't know, chewing gum or, or riding pens, you know, cheap riding pens, because for most products, not everyone wants to buy it. Not everyone is, is a, a viable customer for that particular product. So you don't want to focus on those uh, that uh, are highly unlikely to buy your product. And we'll talk about that here in a minute. Uh, then you design strategies to kind of uh, service those targets. You develop programs to carry out your strategies, and then you manage the effort. So once the marketing programs are underway, you don't just sit back and wait for things to happen. You have to continually manage the effort and make sure things are going swimmingly. A lot of definitions I use throughout this course. I uh, want to go ahead and throw those out here for you so you have them, um, just so we're clear about what we're talking about. Uh, needs, wants, demands. Needs are basic human requirements. Water, food, shelter, belonging, self-affirmation, those type, or, I'm sorry, self-actualization, those types of things. Those are basic human requirements. They are needs. Then we have wants. Wants are things that are possibly going to satisfy a particular need. So um, a bottle of water satisfies the need to quench your thirst. A McDonald's satisfies the need for hunger. Uh, staying at a hotel or buying a house satisfies the need for shelter. But McDonald's in and of itself is a want. It's not a need. It's a want that satisfies the need. Okay, and then we have demands. Demands are just uh, wants for specific products backed by an ability to pay. So it's just basically demands are wants plus money and ability. Okay, so I am an, an Italian American. I uh, love Ferrari. Uh, I want really bad to have a Ferrari. But I don't have the ability to pay for a Ferrari, so uh, it stops there. I have a need for transportation, which leads to a want for a Ferrari, but it's the, the, the buck stops there for me because I don't have the ability to pay, so there's zero demand for Ferrari coming from me. So think about this question for just a second. You know, Pause the recording if you need to um, in order to, uh, to think about this in more detail. But uh, the question is, does marketing create needs or satisfy them? So go ahead and hit pause, think about it for a second, and then come back. Well, in my face-to-face -face classes, when I, I pose this question, there's usually a very heated debate. Uh, the uh, first people to raise their hands will say, marketing definitely creates needs. I didn't need an iPhone. I didn't know about an iPhone until marketing told me I needed an iPhone. Okay, and someone will say, well, yeah, I kind of agree with that, but we had a need for communication, we had a need for belonging, so maybe the need was already there. Uh, and yep. And then someone will finally raise their hand and say, marketing doesn't create needs, marketing creates wants that satisfies needs. So if you go back and think about the definitions of these two terms again, needs are basic human requirements, wants are things that satisfy the need. Okay? So the correct answer is marketing does not create needs. It creates wants to satisfy needs. Okay? So, and you may be thinking, well, that doesn't, doesn't seem right. Go back to the definition of needs. Needs are basic human requirements. Needs are always there. They have always been there. An iPhone doesn't create the need for belonging, which would be linked to the need for communication. The need was already there. The iPhone is a want to help satisfy that need for belonging, that need for self-actualization, that need for uh, socialization, we could say. So the need was already there. The want is just a mechanism to satisfy that. So if you totally disagree with that, I understand. Not a problem, but technically uh, that is the, the correct answer. We satisfy needs through the creation of wants. Okay. 
I mentioned cars, I mentioned Ferrari, here's a, a Ferrari. Um, I'd like to have this if one of you uh, would like to pass around a collection and uh, uh, collect some money and uh, help me buy this car, that would be great. Um, but, eh, not going to happen. I've got a very bad sense of humor, which you probably are, are learning now. just want to warn you up front. Okay, so consider this Ferrari. And, and consider this as we go through the next couple of slides. Some more definitions. We have this process in marketing called segmentation and targeting. And what we're doing is we're actually looking at the entire market. We look at every consumer, let's say, in the United States. And we say, okay, what are some characteristics about um, the entire market that we can break the market down into. So how can we categorize all consumers based on some particular variable? And this is, this is what we're doing in segmentation is we're identifying distinct groups of buyers based on some particular characteristic, be it money, be it what they like to do, be it where they live, be it how they act. It can be lots of different things. Okay? And then once you've identified different groups, then we go into targeting, and with targeting we select target markets, and target markets are those groups that we've identified through segmentation that are most likely to purchase our products or our services or to respond favorably to our messages. So if you think back to the Ferrari example, Ferrari could go in and look at the entire marketplace and say, okay, we know our cars are expensive, we want to know where the rich people are. Okay, so they're going to break a market down by income. They're going to put super, super wealthy in one group, they're going to put somewhat wealthy in another group, and they're going to put middle class and below into a third group. And once they put them into these groups, then they go in and say, okay, we're going to target the super wealthy because they're pretty much the only ones that are willing to, I'm sorry, that are able to purchase our cars. We're not going to worry about the middle class because even though they may love to have a Ferrari, which most of us do, they don't have the ability to pay for it, so we're never going to see any profit from them. So it allows firms to be very efficient to focus on, only on those segments where uh, they have a greater chance of success. You know, why waste advertising money and marketing money and salespeople? Try and target those that are probably not going to buy your product. So it, it allows you to be very focused. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, positioning is just basically what an offering or what a product, what a service means in the minds of the consumer. Okay, so this is it's completely in the mind of the consumer. Uh, it's ne generally not something inherent in the product itself. It's just about in the mind of the consumer. So if you think about Coke versus Pepsi. Well, these two brands have co uh, distinct positions in the marketplace. You know, we think of Coke as the old established well-known brand. They sponsor all these big events like the Olympics and so they're kind of the, the established market leader, old-fashioned, traditional kind of family type brand. Then you got Pepsi. What is Pepsi? Pepsi is young, exciting, it's hip, it's uh, consumed by younger people. So um, these firms have created these distinct positions for themselves. Why do we do this? To set ourselves apart from the competition. If we all have the same position, how will consumers choose? product A over product B. Okay? But again, it's just in the mind of the consumer. There's nothing about the physical taste of Coca-Cola that makes it traditional or makes it family oriented. It's, the, it's a position, it's an image that we've created in consumers' minds that allows them to separate uh, perceptually Coke from Pepsi, from Tab, from RC, from Mountain Dew, from whatever else. Okay? So that's positioning. A few more definitions. Uh, value proposition. This is just a set of benefits offered that satisfy a particular need. So um, the value proposition of a Ferrari is it provides transportation, it provides uh, a very fun driving experience, it provides uh, some social status evidence. Uh, so value is more than just a, a dollar figure here. Value is anything that's attractive to the consumer or to the, p the potential target market. Okay. Related to that is the offering. The offering is a combination of products, services, information, experiences. The, what the offering does is the offering provides the value. The offering creates the value proposition. So the Ferrari, um, again, it's 
a beautiful car. Um, it allows you to get from place to place. It has uh, uh, social benefits as well. Uh, it has an aftermarket warranty. Um, it has other things that come with it. Uh, and all those things together in the offering create value for some consumers. Other consumers it may not. Okay, Then we have the brand. The brand is just an offering from a known source. And again, this kind of relates to positioning. Brand is a mechanism to create a position. It's something that allows you to be identified and to set yourself apart from the competition. Uh, a couple more definitions. The value is the sum of perceived tangible and intangible benefits uh, and minus the costs. So if all the benefits that you could der derive from the product exceed the costs that are incurred to acquire and to use the product, uh, then there's some positive value and there's a chance you might actually purchase it. If the costs exceed the benefits, then there's negative value for that offering for you and so you're not going to purchase it. So firms have to be very, very careful and make sure they have a very solid value proposition that provides positive significant value to the marketplace. Again, if, if the value is negative to the marketplace, uh, to consumers, it's not going to do well. Then we have satisfaction. Satisfaction. Satisfaction is just simply the difference between expected performance and perceived performance on some particular variable. Okay, so you go out and you buy a product, uh, you had some expectation for this product going in, and now you've act actually after you've purchased the product, you use the product, and um, invariably we then take uh, what we've learned about the product through experience. We compare it to what we expected. Um, if the experience is greater than the expectation, we're satisfied. If the experience is worse than the expectation, then we're dissatisfied. Okay? So think about that. Most products that we've bought, we have some sort of expectation. Sometimes they live up to it, sometimes they don't. That determines your level of satisfaction or dissatisfaction. Okay, moving along, we have uh, a couple of eras in marketing. Just basic, this is a very brief, brief history of marketing. Um, first we had what's called the production orientation. This started whenever commerce started and lasted through the probably uh, 1910s, 20s, 30s, somewhere in there. Uh, but basically in this era, uh, firms would come into business, they would say we're going to produce product X, and once we produce product X, we're going to sell product X. They have no information about who their customer is. They have no idea who's going to buy the product. They just produce it. This is kind of, a, if you've seen the movie Field of Dreams, it's kind of a if you build it, they will come type situation where the product is built and then the customers come and they purchase it. Okay? Well, this worked for a while. But as markets got more and more competitive, they realized it didn't work. So what happened is we migrated into uh, what's called the sales orientation. And this is where basically still firms produce products but then they had salespeople go out and push the products on people okay so just sitting back creating the products putting it on the shelf and just sitting back and waiting for people to come isn't enough at this point they decided you have to go out and push the product on people that's the sales orientation well 1950s again competition increased um, people are all selling door to door, they're selling to businesses, they're walking down the street just selling to people. Um, got even more competitive. So what happened here? Um, a third era came into be a, a very modern uh, uh, view of marketing and of the firm and this is called the marketing concept. And the marketing concept just takes the production orientation and completely flips it around. So now, instead of producing the product, then finding who wants to buy the product, you find out untapped wants, unmet needs, untapped sources of value in the marketplace, and then you go and you create and provide this product or service to them. So um, again, you're starting with finding the value before you actually go and produce or create something. Okay, so the production orientation was the exact opposite. You produce something, then you go find uh, sources of value. Marketing concept, again, is the opposite of that. You start with finding the value, the untapped value, then you go and create the value, 
and uh, satisfy those wants and needs, okay? And, and this is really the way marketing is done today. A lot of firms don't do it, but a lot of firms do. And those that do do it, they uh, uh, do very well. Um, so, the marketing concept, that's where, that's where um, uh, we find sources of value. It's very powerful, very important. Okay, current marketing trends, just real briefly. Um, there are a lot of things that have changed over the last, say, 15 years uh, in marketing. And I uh, just want to briefly discuss them. Uh, these are all pretty much related to technology, with the internet, with social media. Uh, the world is getting so much smaller, and it's increasing competition. It's uh, speeding up this uh, idea of globalization and making things much more complicated for both, uh, well, generally for, for firms, but can make it more complicated or can make it easier for consumers. So society as a whole, social media has taken over. Technology has taken over. Globalization is taking over. Marketing uh, firms have uh, they've got to capitalize on this, and, and they're doing that. A lot of firms spend a lot of money to consultants to manage their their social media marketing, to to manage their website marketing. So uh, that's a big uh, big trend. Uh, but along those lines, consumers have evolved, and that's forcing firms to evolve. First of all, we're very price sensitive. Again, if we go back to this idea that we can go shopping on the internet, we can buy products on the internet from any place in the world. Uh, we have access to information and prices for uh, countless firms at our fingertips. You can go to Google Shopping and, and search for a particular product and it'll, it'll list hundreds of places where you can buy the product with their actual price listed right there. So that is making us making us as consumers much more price sensitive. We're more willing to shop around and uh, find the best deal. And uh, that goes hand in hand with declining loyalty because we are able to uh, have more choices. We're more willing to uh, switch from brand to brand. And, and obviously it's not like that with every consumer. It's not like that with every, every context. For uh, instance, I am a, a Honda lover. I've got uh, uh, two Hondas right now. One of them I've actually had for 15 years, and I'm getting ready to trade them both in and get what? Another Honda. So, But there are things where I, I, I'm not necessarily as loyal. Um, actually, a lot less loyal. It's hard to be more loyal than uh, holding having one Honda for 15 years. Uh, consumer resistance. Uh, consumers are... We're bombarded with marketing messages all, all the time between uh, the internet and social media and cell phones and uh, television and billboards. We're becoming resistant to marketing messages. They don't really have the effect they used to have. It used to be a, a kind of, of a novel thing. Think about when you first saw banner ads on a website. It was pretty cool. You'd click on those and see what that was all about. But now, because they're so commonplace, you're resistant to that. So that's a big challenge for a firm is to figure out how to get around this resistance. And then finally, buying power. Consumers have much more buying power. And again, this is linked to this idea that we have numerous accesses, you know, numerous sources of information. We can shop for a TV on 25 different websites in under a minute. So buying power has certainly increased. Now, company. What has changed with companies? Well, they're, they're, they're having to respond to these societal and these consumer trends. So uh, increased customization is a big, is a big thing now. Um, you'll get email messages from firms, advertisements that are to some degree customized to you specifically. So it allows them to be more efficient, allows you to get information that's most relevant to you. So uh, it's, it, it's a big thing. Um, increased competition, obviously I've already mentioned that, but just again the idea of the world's getting smaller, we have access to more information, the competition has increased. And then also we have finally giant power. Um, and what I mean by giant power is large firms are uh, continuing to separate themselves from smaller firms. If you think about Walmart, if you think about Target. Um, you know, they have so much power in the marketplace, they drive the market, and it really causes problems for smaller businesses. So if you're a, a small business in a town where there's a Walmart, um, you're going to have to change your marketing in order to somehow compete with those guys because you're not going to be able to meet them on price. 
So those are some trends in marketing. Relationship marketing. This is basically what it's all about. This is a long-term, people-focused uh, marketing philosophy. Okay, so of course, if you you know are in business, you want everyone that walks through your door, everyone whose door you knock on, to immediately buy your product. That would be ideal. But we know that doesn't happen. So what do you do with those people that don't immediately jump in your arms and say, "Yes, I want to buy your product. I want to buy ten of them." Well, you try to build a relationship with them instead of saying, "Okay, thank you, I'm out of here." Look for the next person. You try to build some sort of long-term, mutually beneficial relationship. So if you think about uh, the pharmaceutical industry and those that are in pharmaceutical sales, um, you know they go in and a lot of times doctors are very resistant to their messages. But what do they do? They come back again and again. They talk about the weather. They ask them about the practice. They, you know, bring them cups of coffee sometimes. Just build a relationship. They don't. A lot of times they don't even talk about the product. They don't even talk about the business. They're just, you know, showing some compassion, showing some concern, and and ultimately, at the end of the day, this this type of uh, um, strategy or this type of relationship works. So um, it's hard sometimes for salespeople and for firms to grasp the idea because, you know, why should I worry about six months from now when I can't even get through today? Well. If you can, so, can somehow manage it, uh, it, it pays off in the long run. It certainly does. Okay, and customization obviously is a big part of part of relationship marketing. You tailor your message to each particular relationship. So, again, long-term focus, uh, beginning with the end in mind. A uh, good example: uh, I was at a Dunkin' Donuts one time, having some coffee and donut. And there was a girl who walked in who had been jogging, and so she was, you know, hot, sweaty, and breathing heavily, and could hardly speak. Uh, all she wanted was a cup of water, so she asked the she asked the uh, the manager if she could have a cup of water. He immediately asked her, well, "Are you going to buy something?" And she said, "Well, no, I was not going to buy anything." The manager replies, "Well, sorry, you know, I can't give you a cup of water unless you're going to buy something. The water's only for paying customers." What do you think about that? On the one hand, yes, absolutely, he has the right to reserve things like that for paying customers. But what are the ramifications of what he did? Well, next time she wants coffee or donuts, guess where she's not going? Dunkin' Donuts. She's going to go to the competition, wherever that might be. Secondly, she's going to tell all her friends how rudely she was treated by this uh, Dunkin' Donuts manager. This idea that, well, he wouldn't give me a simple cup of water, so I'm going to tell all my friends and encourage them to not go there. So the negative publicity there uh, can be can be pretty harmful. So what he should have done was give her the cup of water. Uh, you know, it cost him 10 cents, 15 cents, which is nothing. Next time she needs a donut and a cup of water, or I'm sorry, or a cup of coffee, where is she going to go? She's, I don't know that for a fact, but she certainly is going to at least consider Dunkin' Donuts because of the way she was treated. And secondly, there will be positive word of mouth. She will um, tell her friends, oh, check this out. I went to Dunkin' Donuts and I wasn't going to buy anything. I just asked for a cup of water and they gave it to me. That's pretty cool. People respond to that. So, again, long-term focus. If the manager was uh, aware of relationship marketing, he would have understood that giving her a cup of water would, would provide uh, benefits down the road in most cases. Okay. What we have here are the four, uh, the, is the marketing mix, what we call the four P's, product, price, promotion, and place. Uh, read about these in the book, but just know that there are different uh, ways we manipulate each of these variables of the marketing mix. Okay, we can, uh, you know, how we design the product itself is marketing. How we price the product, that's marketing. How we promote the product, that's marketing. Where we actually sell the product, that's marketing as well. All these things. Uh, come in, fall under the umbrella of marketing. So, um, and in the Markstrat simulation, you will be manipulating each of these. You'll be manipulating the product itself. You'll be giving prices, uh, setting prices. You will decide where to sell the product and how to promote the product as well. So, uh, uh, you'll get to know the, the four P's very well through that process. Okay, internal marketing this is just the idea that there's a customer-centric focus that permeates the firm. Basically, everyone in the firm is a marketer. Whether you're in marketing, whether you're the CEO, an accountant, 
whether you're working on the loading dock or work at the front desk. You always have to be focused on the consumer and the customer and what is it that we're really concerned about and that's uh, making sure the customer is happy. So if you work on the loading dock, what does that mean? Well, that means you're more careful when you load the packages. You, you, you do things uh, realizing that you know, if you don't do this right, the customer is not going to be happy and the customer might go elsewhere, which could harm the firm and could harm your particular job. Um, if you're working the front desk, what does this mean? Well, you're polite to people, you're very efficient, uh, you ask them how the day's going, just be very friendly. So it's all departments. So you begin with the customer in mind regardless of which department you are in. That's internal marketing. Then we have performance marketing. A big knock on marketing is that people say, well, you can't link marketing back to financial performance. And that is absolutely incorrect. There are lots of metrics uh, that can be used uh, to link marketing back to the firm. We could, we could have an entire course just on uh, financial performance of marketing. Okay? Uh, but the idea here is that you've got to justify marketing's value to the organization. CEOs can be somewhat wary of marketing sometimes because sometimes it is complicated to kind of link marketing to financial performance, but it can be done. So uh, and firms must do this. Marketing departments must do this for the sake of themselves and for nothing else. All right, so just generally, what do we do in marketing? We develop strategies, we gather insights. I'm not going to read those, but I mean, because you can read those yourself. Uh, but this is basically what we do. Uh, the next to last bullet point is the most important. At the end of the day, what we want to do is communicate and deliver value, something that consumers just can't live without, something what is just an overwhelmingly positive response. What that does is that allows us to create and uh, sustain growth. And at the end of the day, that's what it's all about. And that's it. If there are any questions, please do not hesitate uh, to get in touch with me and uh, ask me whatever you would like. Thank you very much. Have a great day.